Um, we we spent a couple of uh, a couple of uh, an hour on a couple of verses, kind of doing that with regards to the idea of if any think they're religious, and yet not bridling their tongues, etc., etc., etc. And so he's really quite going on to the piece of what true religion is, according to James, and potentially according to Jesus which may not necessarily be like we often anticipated and expected to be, which is uh, not just belief. Um, I, I am hearing myself an hour on a couple of verses. I'm just going to mute everybody for a moment and we'll figure that out, hoping that it. I, and I muted everybody, and I can still hear myself. So weird. Hold on. I'm just going to try a totally different way. Can you hear me now? Cool. It was uh, not working well in my headphones. When I was hearing myself... Um, 10 seconds after I said it over and over again, it starts to drive me a little crazy. And I mean, look at me, I don't need to be any far crazier. So again, we're gonna go in, we've done James. We know a little bit about James already. James is writing to people in about 50 AD probably, um, talking to people who are Messianic Jews. And so we will call them as we have been the Messianic community. Um, but still they're Jews and still they're with a whole bunch of other Jews and they're being persecuted. And a lot of the persecutions that are going on are the type of persecution that may be something like, uh, well, you know, uh, the rich against the poor. Uh, that's the piece that's been kind of going on with the whole thing. And I forgot that I'm supposed to be streaming on Facebook, so I'm pushing that real quick. I'm gonna see how quickly I can do this. I want to apologize. Next. Get involved in conversation and stop doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Oh. And so today we're going to go into chapter two. And, uh, and I think we're probably going to focus on the first four verses, but we're going to read the first 13 verses in an effort to uh, figure out a little bit about what James is doing. Does anyone have a Bible in front of them who would like to read, let's say, the first uh, four verses of chapter two there. I can do that. Thank you. <clears throat> My brothers as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there, or sit on the floor at my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Oh, wow, that's going to be fun to talk about. <laughs> Uh, Tony, could you reread verse one for me, please? I, I, uh, I just want to make sure I, I heard it right. My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have a different translation that they would like to read to kind of get a different flavor? I will read the uh, New Revised Standard Version. Tony, what was your version? Uh, NIV. NIV. And the NIV is good there, too, and I'll explain why. Uh, but my brothers and sisters, do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe in our Lord Jesus Christ? Um, so verse 1 is, is asked as a question in the NRSV, and it's told as a statement in the NIV. And as we're talking about things real quick, why might that make a difference? Even as you hear it or you think like, what might be the difference between James saying a statement like, your acts of favoritism are not showing that you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ versus do you really think that your acts of favoritism are showing 
belief in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Both use glorious. We'll talk about that in a second as well. But like, what's the difference between a statement and a question? And why are the, why are the Bible trans, well, the Bible translators can't figure it out because to be honest, you can read the Greek in a couple of different ways and you get a whole bunch of smart people in a room who know Greek, they're gonna start talking about how they know it the best and then you're gonna have different translations of the Bible, which is what happens. Um, but I'm not interested in which translation is right. I'm more interested in why are the different translations, might they say something differently according to you? I don't know if this is what you're looking for, but to me, when you ask a question, it asks people to think about it in relation to themselves. If you make a statement, you're not really asking them anything about themselves and they could even become defensive or just say, no, that's not me. That's brilliant. And it's brilliant because that's not at all what I was looking for. Which is why <laughs> I like to ask the questions. Like, no, that's really good. I hadn't thought of it that way. I was thinking of it that way. It's like, is it a question? Well, then like, oh, no, that's not me versus the statement like, oh, no, I have to listen. Irrespective, like the joy that we're not sure which it is, is beautiful. Uh, one way or another, James doesn't want us to be able to get away from the statement or the question, we have to deal with it. The community has to deal with it. And I remember once hearing a story of a friend of mine, and he went into this church, it was his first call, and he would write these uh, prayers of confessions. And he had very, uh, I guess, fairly elaborate prayers of confessions. And there was a couple in his church, and, and the guy would take the bulletin and take a pen, and he would scratch out anything that he decided he didn't need to confess. And so he, and sometimes he would just wouldn't say any of the confession. And uh, I'm like, well, that's a fascinating thing. I've never heard anyone do that. But James is trying to make sure that you can't get away. You can't scratch it out. Like, do you think with your acts of favoritism or are your acts of favoritism, it doesn't matter. Are they really, and, and why glorious Lord Jesus Christ? Does anyone have any idea how many times they've read glorious Lord Jesus Christ in the Bible? I'll give you a clue. It's between zero and two, and it's not zero or two. So there's one time of our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, which is the most Christological thing that James says in his whole letter. Um, what might be uh, he mean by glorious Lord Jesus Christ? If anybody wants to take a stab at that. I can't hear you, you're uh, muted, but I'm glad I could see you. <laughs> When I think of, I'm a choir member, and when I think of glorious, I think of those big, big hymns, light flowing from heaven, and angels, and and the Lord sitting in the center, Jesus as glorious Lord, what I think of. Oh, I mean, you think of it as glorious. I mean, that's, that's brilliant. I mean, like, uh, in the Old Testament, and, and glorious comes from the word doxa, which is where like we get doxology from as well. Um, so it's this idea of giving glory. And, and who is ascribed glory in glory alone in the Old Testament? God. God. Only God gets the glory. And, and I mean, if you've ever been a part of a Baptist church, you sometimes have a person get up who says, first giving all glory and honor to God. And, uh, and uh, I mean, that's common. It's common in the black church as well. People get up in any kind of, first giving all glory and honor to God. The recognition that God alone gets the glory. And anyone remember any story in the Old Testament, and maybe you don't, maybe you do, where the glory of God is revealed somehow? Moses on, the, on Mount Sinai. Oh, yes. Moses on Mount Sinai. One of the beautiful, wonderful, curious stories of all of Exodus and the, there by the Bible as well. I mean, here is God and God tells the people, you have three days to prepare for me. Three. Nowadays, if somebody's finally ready to talk to God, they're like, God, you damn well better be ready for me. But no, this one was God's like, you have three days to get ready and it's going to take you full three days because when I show up, the earth is going to quake. There's going to be a sound of, I don't know what the number of trumpets are, so I'll make it up. A billion, billion trumpets. 
There's going to be lightning and thunder, and it, it's going to be terrifying. And by the way, when my presence, my glory, shows up on the mountain, if you touch the mountain, you will die. And the word for death has this sense of an angry God as well. Like God's anger will unleash upon you. And the, and the Hebrew word for death right there, or, or, or anger, God's anger, is like the, the nostrils that are flaring when one is angry, and maybe even of a stallion trampling them to death. And when God shows up in three days and other, suddenly the earth starts shaking and there's the sound of a billion, billion trumpets and there's lightning and there's thunder. And Moses is outside telling everybody, come on, everybody, it's okay. They're like, oh, heck no, we're going to stay right here. Because <laughs> God's glory is something that is altogether immense in a way that begins to literally blow our minds. And so when he uses glorious, this is a man who's Jewish. He's not trying to run away from what God's glory is. He's ascribing the glory of God to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Lord is also a word that would be used to describe God. I'm not saying, by the way, that our complex Christologies that our theologians have come up with over the course of a long time is anything what James is trying to get here. He doesn't care about the complex Christologies that we like to play with or that we use to divide churches because we want to be right and tell everybody else why they're wrong because we believe better than they do. Uh, James doesn't care. He's trying to do something in an argumentative and rhetorical way by ascribing glory to God. And ascribing glory to Jesus, what happens when we show favoritism? Basically, we're giving glory to somebody else over and against somebody else. And so by doing that, we're taking away the gloriousness of Jesus, the gloriousness of God. Well, if, if God alone is glorified, if Christ, now, now Christ can do this in one of two ways. And again, James doesn't get into it, but it's interesting enough to share. There's, uh, there's the one first way of like, yes, this is, this is all his. Uh, there's the, uh, the second way of his glorified because of his resurrection and ascension and his, his exaltation by God. And he'll be glorified in the, uh, mostly the eschaton, the end of time. So it's either the right now or the end of time. Either way, it doesn't matter how Christ is glorified because, one, you're going to be judged at the end of time because what does Christ think about how your situation of splitting up, as we're going to find out whenever I get to verse 2, the rich and poor. If your favoritism between the rich and poor is being shown, what does Jesus think about that? Or better yet, even what does the Old Testament God think about that? Which is, by the way, God, please not ascribe God to be like somehow different in the Old Testament because you don't like dealing with occasional anger God. Uh, but, but God. What's God think about showing favoritism? Not in favor of it. Not in favor of it. There's a couple of times in Deuteronomy where you're not allowed to show any partiality to anybody, especially when it comes in times of judgment. Be just. Uh, we could get into a whole conversation about justice systems and their justice with regards to the poor and rich. That might be interesting because James is getting into it, but I don't want to get into that because that might start making, I do, but not yet. So do you really believe your acts of favoritism or do you, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? Does he think that they really believe? I don't know. Um, I think he thinks they don't get it. Ah, let that blossom. Well, I mean, he, he, as you said, he makes a statement or he makes a question. So he's saying to them, Think about this. This is you. And can you reconcile how you treat others with your profession of faith in Christ? 
Amen. And isn't it time that we start asking that question in the present time? Amen. And the reason I say that is because here we already hear over and over again, if we're Christians, if we've been going to church, that you are saved by faith alone. And by what we've meant by saved by faith alone, we use Jesus as a get out of hell free card. Like, you don't have to pass through. I mean, even the Catholics have gotten rid of purgatory now. Oh, I believe in Jesus. Straight to heaven. It's not going to be a problem. I don't have to worry about anything I do in this life because I have a get out of hell free card. That's an unfortunate consequence of so much current Christianity. And Jesus and James and Paul, and in fact, the whole of the New Testament witness says that's a whole bunch of bollocks. But Protestants especially like to do it that way because at least then we don't have to buy indulgences from the Roman Catholic Church to get our friends out of purgatory, which they got rid of around 150 years ago or so. And so, No, it was even less time. It was this, this millennia. Um, and it doesn't matter. But again, so glorious Lord Jesus Christ in favoritism. God's not for it. James knows that. He's going to say some more. And, and, uh, and, uh, and, and we heard it read already from one version. I'll just keep on going for verse 2. For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and the word for assembly is the same word for synagogue, um, and, and that makes sense because synagogue means assembly, but simultaneously, like, is he talking about the community meeting in the synagogue? Is he talking about the community having its own synagogue? Is he talking about just a regular assembly? Um, my guess is that he probably was talking about the assembly of messianic believers who were gathering together. And when they gathered together, uh, they would have done two, three, four things. There was always the worship aspect. There was the teaching aspect. But there was also the justice aspect. Uh, in synagogues uh, before the time of Christ and after the time of Christ, and probably in the earliest of churches as well, the churches took time to dole out justice among the membership of the church. Um, basically calling people to be more just, and if had they had not been just, they would try to make sure that something was done in accordance with God's will to continue people moving along what we would call the way. Now, if I ever took time in a church service these days to tell everybody, okay, we're going to judge you all today, quite literally, and let's make you better. I imagine that that particular church would shrink to the point of nothing pretty quickly. Or maybe it wouldn't. Maybe it would become one of those places that people wanted to be present because they could watch themselves becoming more Christ-like. But I don't know, and I'm not sure I'm going to try to find out. At least not right now. Um, I'm certainly not ever going to tell it. We're going to judge everybody today. That's not like, it's just, it's that, anyway, I'm sorry. But then you have the one person come in with the fine clothes and the gold rings. And immediately when you hear a fine clothes and gold rings, what kind of people are we talking about? Rich people. The rich people. Uh, the, the word for gold rings literally means gold finger. And when I found that out, of course, I chuckled because I thought of James Bond, but that's not here. <laughs> and, um, and in fine clothes, and, and, and what kind of fine clothes might some of the rich people of the past have worn? Fine weaving. What was that? I'm sorry? Fine weaving. Yes, fine weaving. Um, different colors, too. Uh, it took a lot of money to have color in your clothing because the color came from other kinds of places everywhere. And um, what, is, what do you think Jesus thought of clothing and, and things of that nature as well? Well, first of all, they didn't have closets. Because maybe they only had one garment or two garments unless you're very rich. Exactly. And so you're, and they're going to get worn. Um, anyone ever like to empty out their closets because they only wear about three things anyway? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't wear very much. I'm trying to find the piece that I want to share. 
You know, again, I, I know I've done this every time. I, I write it down. Oh, have I already skipped that far ahead? Bless me. Okay, Luke chapter 7, verse 25. If you have a Bible and you can get to Luke chapter 7, verse 25 before me, please read it. It says, if not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. And he's talking right there of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, did he wear any kind of fine clothing? No. No, the dude, like he wove clothing out of camel's hair. I have been looking for an outfit like that for Halloween. I, I, I haven't found anything that I think is right. Um, but uh, like, he's not trying to go for things here. And I think I've described it in a church service or a, a Bible study it, with us before of like, what would it be like this fantastically crazy fellow who's yelling and screaming at, a, at, a, at the River Jordan and, and dunking or people are pouring water over. We don't really know what he was doing exactly for the baptisms, but there he is screaming about repentance, wearing, uh, what's a camel hair clothing even look like? Burlap. Yeah, a flap of stuff. And there he is. he's got sticky hands with honey and like pieces of locusts in his teeth. And like his beard is covered in like guts. Like, I mean, what's this guy doing? And, and he's not rich, he lived out there. The reason he ate honey and locusts is because that's what was available. And Jesus is already comparing John to those who are traditionally religious at the time and how religious they were by their fine clothing and uh, what they wore and that they would be in palaces. Now, if we're beginning to talk about the way we do church, Maybe we're being more like a church by being at home and in our pajamas than we've ever been wearing our Sunday best and showing how much we have. I don't know. Um, we can also go into Luke chapter 16 when we start to think about rich people and what they wear and such. And I'm not trying to pick on rich people, but James is. So in this part two, he tells a parable in Luke chapter 16, starting at verse 19. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted substance. I can't substitute. You know when you say the word wrong and you can't say it right? Substitute. I can't do it. <laughs> I'm so glad that this is just with you all and not like in front of a substitute sleep. Boy, that's hard for me today. Every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores. You know the story. The rich man in Lazarus parable, and, and it goes on, who longed to satisfy his hunger what, with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. Again, dogs were dirty animals to the Jews. That would be especially gross. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades where he was being tormented. He looked up and saw Abraham from far away with Lazarus by his side. You know the story. Father Abraham, make Lazarus still work for me. And, uh, and Father Abraham is like, not a chance on God's green earth. <laughs> um, but you have this thing where, again, every time that Jesus begins to use the ideas of what rich people are clothed like, it is never in a positive light. And James now goes into it a little bit as well. For again, if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly. Now we have to ask the question, is this a messianic believer or is someone just visiting? I don't know. Does it make a difference? <laughs> I don't know. And if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of one wearing the fine clothes and say, here, have a seat, please, while to the other who is poor, you say, stand there or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves? 
and become judges with evil thoughts. All right, so here are the first four verses of this particular chapter. Um, again, we'll, we'll, we'll read some more in a second. But as you, as you see some of these things, what is James hinting at and how is it connected to what came before? Well, they're all looking, which is pretty about some good <laughs> Maybe it's that you're not as good a Christian as you think. Yeah, maybe. There's a part of that. And how does that feel to, well, how does that feel? Not good. Not good. And don't you want Bible study to make you feel better? <laughs> like I, and this is where we need to be concerned about something. Do you remember how Karl Marx famously is quoted as saying that religion, religion is the opium of the masses? Uh -huh. Of the masses? Um, and, and in context, that makes more sense, but I'm taking it out of context, and, and most of us know about what that means. Um, there's, a, there's still a, a truth to that. If we're going to be talking about how we're trying to tell people, well, you believe in religion because if life sucks right now, at least you're going to heaven. And so you can keep people where they are because you're telling them they have the promise of heaven. You get to believe in the pie in the sky. Don't worry about now. Is anyone familiar with the great mystic poet, prophet, and teacher of Martin Luther King Jr., Howard Thurman? Howard Thurman wrote a book uh, called, why am I totally blanking on it right now? Oh, this is not good. I wish I wasn't live on Facebook. I'm, I'm feeling horrible about that. Um, Jesus and the Disinherited. Oof. Jesus and the Disinherited was written in the 1940s. And it was, uh, it was fascinating because he begins talking about why he wrote the book uh, when, he, when he was a part of a delegation that went to India and was going to encounter Gandhi and some others and, and what that was like. And as he's having a conversation with these people, one person takes him aside and talks to him and says, why are you here? And you say, well, well, I'm here because, you know, Christians are trying to get to understand what's going on in India a little bit with the nonviolent movement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he's like, no, no, no. Why are you here? I, I know why the white people are here. But I don't know why you are here. Because this religion has been used by people who look like them to hold you down the whole time. You got to, your ancestors got to hear sermons from white preachers where they used their holy scriptures that said, slave, obey your master and kept you there. Why are you here? And they had a long conversation over the course of hours that moved him to the place of writing Jesus, Jesus for the disinherited in an effort to try to explain what Jesus was really like. And John, James is trying to do the same with a community of people. What is Jesus really like? How much money did Jesus have? None. Not much, if any. And if, it, if he had any, someone else carried it around. He, 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 he didn't keep things. It wasn't of his purview. He didn't care for it. And, and again, the way that we go about everything, and, and I'm not pointing any fingers, and I'm not also pointing it myself, by the way, Barb. So if it feels bad, I apologize. It feels bad for me, too. <laughs> but even, I mean, you were, you were hitting this right again, like, and he says it in verse one, verse, chapter one, verse nine, let the believer who is lowly boast in being raised up and the rich in being brought low because the rich will disappear like a flower in the field. He's going right back and smashing people who are talking about what they have is making them something. Because again, the idea about what they're made is not what they can make of themselves. It's who they already are is made by God. And so now he's saying, if 
You're going to let anyone come into your assembly, whether they be Christians or whether they be guests, and you see one who's dressed fine and lovely, and you see another who's dressed awful and dirty clothes, and you say to the one who's fine and lovely, come, come sit, take my seat, take my seat. Take the place of honor. And again, if Jesus is the glorious Lord Jesus Christ, who is the only one who deserves a place of honor in a Christian setting? Anybody? The servant. The servant. Yes, yes, yes. Maybe the lowly one, the people that you wouldn't expect, Jesus himself. I remember when in my first church in, in Albany, Georgia, and it wasn't my first church working for one, but it was the first time I was ordained. I was, I was a minister. I was very, I was, I was cleanly shaven, very wonderful short hair. I, I wore my, my suits and ties. I wore fedoras still. I, I looked apart. I put on my robe every Sunday. If I didn't, my grandma would scream at me. I would wear the robe. I'd wear the stoles. I had the cross. I looked the part of a Presbyterian minister through and through. And, and, and I liked that. But, but they had these seven elder chairs behind the pulpit. Oh, my gosh. You know, it was an old church. It was 160 years old. And it was this kind of, and the, and the building itself was 90 years old. They had these seven chairs for the, and they called them the elder chairs, one for each day of the week. And I have no idea, 90 years before, how they went using those seven chairs, but I was the only one sitting behind the pulpit. And I would always sit off to one side or the other, generally the left side, because I'm left-handed. And theologically, I was like, I should not be on the side of power. I should certainly be on the side that uh, you wipe your rear end with. <laughs> Sometimes it comes out of my mouth and immediately oh, gets my mom yelling at me. And um, I can hear. So I'd sit off to the left side and, 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 and people would ask me, why don't you sit in the middle? That's where the pastors always sat. The, the preacher sits in the middle. There's no one else up there. Why are you sitting on one side? And I said, well, hopefully that's where Jesus is sitting. And if I do my job well, when I stand up to talk, he's going to push me out of the way and then you'll actually hear a word from the Lord. And, and so we have this sense of like, if you're going to start giving the rich people, the people who look fine, the people that you know are going to put money in, into the offering plates so you can have it going on for, if that's who you're going to get excited when you see. And I have seen that in churches I've been a part of since the moment I have memory. Every church I've been a part of, when somebody comes in who, who has a bit of local celebrity or maybe even bigger than local celebrity and, and, and you know they have a little bit of money I, I watch how people gravitate around oh we're so glad you're at our church the, the hospitality level suddenly shoots through the roof I, I don't know if people would be that excited sometimes if Jesus showed up <laughs> in fact if we didn't know it was Jesus when we saw him I, we may not actually be excited at all you probably have heard the story. It went through the internet, um, and it might still be going through the internet. And I heard a version of it before I saw it go through the internet. But, but many, many years ago, I, I heard a story of a young man who, uh, who, whose family had just enough money to get him to college. And he was in college, and it was going well. But when Christmas rolled around, uh, they did not have money to bring him home for Christmas. And so he had to stay in the dorms for Christmas his first year. And if you've ever been a young person who's alone on the holidays uh, in, a, in a dorm hall that's utterly empty of everybody because they're all excited to go see their family, you know that it isn't the most enjoyable of experiences. And, and he did not bring any of his nice clothes with him when he went to college. He only brought the stuff they could carry in one suitcase. And so he was on Christmas Eve thinking to himself, my family always goes to Christmas Eve services and I don't want to be all alone. So I'm going to go to the Christmas Eve service. And he starts looking through his stuff, but he's a college student. And you all know that college students, especially boy college students, they don't always wash their clothes. And, 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 and 
really, they won't wash any of their clothes the whole time. Not until they get home with the whole luggage they came with. Mom, here are my clothes. Uh, good luck. And, uh, but, but so he was one like that and he didn't have any clean clothes except he had one pair of jeans that had holes in them. And there was a stain, but at least they were clean. And he wanted to make sure that he gave his best to Jesus on, on Christmas Eve. And so he put on his clean jeans, even though they were holes and had a stain on, but he couldn't find a clean shirt. He found one clean shirt in all of his shirts. And the clean shirt that he found had a picture of Bob Marley smoking something or another on it, but at least that's what he had and it was clean. So he put on his clean shirt of Bob Marley smoking something or another and his clean jeans that while they were holes and, and had a stain on them, at least they were clean. And he went to a church that he knew was having a Christmas Eve service and he walked in a little bit late. And sometimes on Christmas Eve, everybody comes to church. I remember when I was again in the Deep South, the Christmas Eve service was the day the church was packed. We had more people on Christmas Eve than we did on Easter or Mother's Day. And that's saying a lot in the Deep South. On Mother's Day, you have all kinds of people who show up for the very first time and they're like, I'm here for Mother's Day. And I'm like, I'm glad your mother must be delighted that you're in church today. Uh, she is, I don't believe a word of it, Pastor, but I'm really glad that you're here. And I'm like, well, thank you. Maybe, maybe you'll come back. Uh, they never did. Mother's Day was that way. But he comes to church late on Christmas Eve. And it was packed. Uh, there was not a seat to be found. And he's looking around, trying to find a seat. And, and, and people saw him. And as soon as they saw him, well, you know what they did. You know the story. And even if you don't know the story, you have an idea what they did. They started moving just enough to make sure that whatever seat was around them disappeared. Some of them started whispering under their breath. How dare he? How dare? You know how people whisper under their breath to make sure that they get their feelings across. And, and, and this poor kid was heartbroken. He just wanted to be with people who might accept him and love him, treat him as if maybe he were a little bit like Jesus. Even though he knew he wasn't. And he knew that he was wearing jeans with holes in them and a stain, even though they were clean and a shirt of Bob Marley smoking something or another. And he didn't know where else to go. And so he kept walking forward in the church. And he got to the communion table that was set up. And, and there was the preacher who was looking at him with those preacher eyes that preachers do when they're trying to scold people and tell them how they're going to help. And it, oh. And the kid just didn't know what to do. And so he sat down in front of the communion table and crossed his legs. And the whole place went quiet. I mean, this must have been a Presbyterian church. Of course it was. It went quiet. And someone was waiting for someone to tell him he's not allowed to sit there. And in the back row was a older woman named Marjorie and in she had been the first woman elder who had been a part of that church in the church's history up until they voted for Marjorie. They had never voted for a woman to be elder before. That wasn't allowed. The Bible said so. But she stood up and she had a cane. She grabs her cane and she starts walking down the aisle. And everyone's like, good. Elder Marjorie is going to tell him he's not allowed to sit there. And apparently the preacher doesn't have the guts to do it. And she gets up. And as she gets closer... She, she puts her cane off onto the side, hangs it off one of the front pews, and, and with weak knees and a hard back, it takes her literally two minutes to get down and sit next to him and put her arm around him. With our acts of favoritism, do we really believe in the glorious Lord Jesus Christ? I heard a story at one time. I need to think of the fellow's name. Tony Campolo. Have you heard of Tony Campolo? Yes, yes, Tony Campolo. Have you heard the story about Hilda, the, the prostitute in Honolulu? I don't actually know if her name is Hilda. It might be. It's, it's like whole go. Oh, yeah, I think I did hear that one. Well, the story goes a little bit like this. Now, Tony Campolo is from Philadelphia. And he's going to go speak 
at a conference of some kind or another in Honolulu, Hawaii, and he flies in. And now the time difference between Philadelphia and Honolulu is, uh, well, it's big. No, 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 it'll be. And so he's waking up at two in the morning or one in the morning, and, and, and he's just up and he doesn't know what to do. So one of the first mornings he wakes up, he leaves his hotel and he asks the, the, the concierge at the hotel, is there a place where I can get a, a cup of coffee or something like that? And the guy's like, yeah, 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 there's a diner just down the street. So he goes down the street and he goes into this 24 hour diner and he sits down and, and the guy's like, yeah, do you want a menu? Yeah, I'll take a menu, he gives him a menu. And he's got these greasy hands and the, the menu's sticky and, and he's bringing out some food and he's not washing his hands. And, and, and the guy's like, what do you have? And he's like, um, uh, are these donuts made here? And he's like, no, they're yesterday's donuts from the donut shop down the street. He's like, I'll have a donut and, uh, and a cup of coffee. And, and so the guy gets him a donut, a cup of coffee. He's sitting there drinking his coffee, eating his donut. He's there for a couple of hours because, you know, and around two o'clock when the bars start closing, Suddenly, there's three women of the night who come into this diner, and, and, the, and the man who's, the, who's serving and is obviously the owner says, oh, says to him, like, they obviously come in every night, get some whatever. The, the three prostitutes are talking to each other, and Tony's just not dealing with them at all. And then finally, he hears uh, one of them say, uh, you know, tomorrow's my birthday. And I, and I don't remember what her name is, but I'm going to call her Hilda because I, I, she needs to have a name. And it was like Hilda. And I should figure out her name. It would be important for the story. But uh, the, the other two said, well, Hilda, why are you telling us? What do you want us to do? We'll get you a birthday cake? And she's like, no, you don't have to be so mean. I, I, I didn't expect a birthday cake. No one has ever celebrated my birthday. <laughs> but I just wanted to let somebody know that tomorrow was my birthday. And they got up and they left after they were done eating. And Tony Campolo says to this fellow who's serving, he's like, hey, excuse me, uh, those, those three women, do they come in every night? And the guy's like, yeah, every night they come in when they're done with some whatever they're doing. And uh, they, you know, they, they eat. And she's like, well, so the one who's having a birthday, is she in here every night? Yeah, she's in here every night. Well, can we throw a birthday party for her tomorrow night? He's like, are you serious? Yeah, I'm serious. I'll, I'll go buy a birthday cake. And, um, and, and, and no, no, I'll, I'll buy the birthday cake. I think this is a great idea. And he, he yells into the kitchen, hey, sweetie, uh, this man wants to throw Hilda a birthday party. And she comes out of the kitchen. That sounds like a great idea. We'll get streamers. So they build up this whole thing. There's streamers. And, 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 the, and they'll make sure I'm going to tell the street committee about what's going on. And I don't even know exactly what the street committee is. But I, I so someone tells the street committee. And anyway, the next night, he comes in there and the place is decorated. They have a big cake and the big cake says, happy birthday, Hilda. And, and there it's all going and they're all getting ready. And, and suddenly right around the time where they're getting ready, like to get nervous in that kind of moment. And then in walks Hilda and her three friends. And this place is packed with all kinds of prostitutes from every corner of Honolulu. And they all scream out, happy birthday, Hilda. And she's, <gasps> and they're all like, oh, and she starts crying. I've never had a surprise party before. I, I've never had a party before. And then they bring her up and they sit her down and, and, and they bring her a cake and they're singing happy birthday. And then and, and they give her a knife and they're like, cut the cake, Hilda, cut the cake, Hilda. It's going to be and, and, and she's like, um, do I have to? And they're like, well, uh, you don't have to. It's, it, it's your cake. You can do with it whatever you want. And she was like, okay, thank you. And she puts the knife down, she picks up the cake and she leaves. And everybody's just staring at each other now. And here's Tony Campolo, a, a, a preacher and, and the owner of the place and his wife and all these prostitutes. And, and Tony's like, I didn't know what to do. So I just said to everyone, let's pray. And they're like, uh, okay. And so suddenly now he's in this circle of a bunch of prostitutes and this greasy fellow and his wife and he's praying. They, they pray that she have a good birthday and that she'd feel love, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he's done praying. And the guy says to him, who's there, this greasy fellow who turns to him and says, uh, you didn't tell me you were a preacher. Oh yeah, I didn't. 
what kind of preacher are you? Like, what kind of church are you from? And Tony thinks about it for a second. He's like, I, I guess I'm, I'm a preacher from a kind of church that will throw birthdays for prostitutes. And the guy looks at it, thinks for a second, chuckles. Says, nah, you're not a preacher. There's no church like that. If there was a church like that, I'd join it. How? By our favoritism. And we show it. Barb, the reason you don't love the idea of it is because somewhere inside, I know I still show it. When I see someone I think can benefit me, I know I still show it. And James has no tolerance or room for any of that. Stand there, sit at my feet. No, who gets the spot? And some of you said the servant gets the spot. The lowest person gets the spot. Jesus in Matthew 25, whatever you've done for the least of these who are members of my family, they get the spot. And it's not partiality or anything. It's lifting up those who've never experienced anything. They get the spot. And he says in verse 4, have you not made distinctions among yourselves? How do we still make distinctions among ourselves? We separate classes of people all the way. Oh, you've done this wrong. We can no longer tolerate you. You're, you're excommunicated. Even if we won't say that, we'll never talk to you ever again. Or, oh, yes, 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 yes. Come on in. Come on in. We see that happen in all sorts of ways. And we see Christians do that with all kinds of people in an effort to get whatever they want done. They make distinctions. And what's the problem with distinctions? Divisions is another way that word can be translated. Glorify somebody besides Jesus. There's a glorifying somebody beside Jesus again. Absolutely. My Bible says, my Bible says discriminates. Woo, I like that translation uh, a little bit. What's wrong with discrimination? <laughs> we put ourselves as judge and jury and above judge and jury you've made distinctions among yourselves do you remember when paul wrote in galatians chapter 5 verse 26 is that right oh don't quote me on it. i need to start stop saying things i don't have memorized in any kind of way that's going to be online for eternity if you're watching this a thousand years from now i didn't know i'm sorry um <laughs> but when he says uh uh, you know that piece about the, the, there's no longer Jew or Greek, there's no longer slave or free, there's no longer male and female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. Paul believed that. James believes that. And if you're beginning to discriminate between those who are rich and those who are poor, well, that's not the way of Christ. And it's not the way of God ever either. God never was comfortable with that. And then it says again, and become judges with evil thoughts. And again, someone's right. Who's judge? Who's the only judge? God. Really? It's God. And he's going to say that in chapter four, by the way. If we start acting as the judge, we take away God's prerogative to judge as God wants to judge. That was a lot of talk of God. No, that doesn't mean that we don't have to figure out something. But, but, but judge, judge, judge that way. Now, judging also being not only the prerogative of God, what happens when we judge and we are not God? Let me put it this way. Have human beings ever made any mistakes in their judgments that they, at the initial time, thought they were incredibly righteous with? And what happens when you start judging people based off their appearance, their economic condition, their ability to serve you in a different kind of way that you'd prefer? You're wrong. <laughs> and you start to undermine the very feelings uh, or the image in which they're made. 
Um, that's the problem with judgment. Now, I'm not saying that you, we, we can't say to some things, this isn't right. Uh, that's certainly the case. James is doing that right now. He's saying this isn't right. You're not supposed to act this way. He's acting as a judge, but he, in the midst of the whole thing, is asking them to repent of their ways, to do this way of unity, to stop being the judge. Because if it's not a judge of saying, this isn't right, and he's just trying to get them to repent. He's not threatening them with death, although he does threaten them with eternal punishment. <laughs> uh, I should have thought about that one before I started saying, but with evil thoughts. What are evil thoughts? Well, in this case, I, in this case, I'd say it's thinking that somehow you're better than somebody else. And and they, and I'm, like, I'm sorry, you weren't done. And you have the right to s sit there and judge like that. Um, I'm not better than anybody. And nobody's better than me. I, I tell my son that sometimes. I'm like, never go into any place thinking that you're better than anyone you're not. And don't think that anyone's better than you either. And, and the reason for that is if you start thinking everything, everyone's better than you too, you start hating yourself because you're not them. Or if you think you're better, you hate them because they're not you. Regardless, you're comparing yourself to them. That doesn't really help you become exactly what Christ wants you to be. An evil thought in the midst of that too, just to say some things with evil thoughts. This isn't an abstract thing that only James is talking about, by the way. Matthew 15, 19, out of the heart comes evil intentions. Luke 2, 35, the evil thoughts of many will be revealed. Luke 5, 22, when Jesus perceived their questioning. Luke 5, 9, 47, Jesus aware of their inner thoughts. Luke 24, 38, why do doubts arise in your hearts? Romans 1, 21, they became futile in their thinking. Romans 14, 1, not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. 1 Corinthians 3.20, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. Philippians 2.14, do all these things without murmuring and arguing, which again, that word is thinking. 1 Timothy 2.8, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument, which again, that word is, th these are all evil thoughts. What James has in mind is evil thoughts that corrupt the mental processes of human beings. And those evil thoughts are ones that we begin to think that someone is more special than somebody else. I think I wrote it in a, in a daily meditation. Maybe the last one, I don't remember. I, you know, when you say and talk and write so much that you're not ever sure what you say anymore. <laughs> but uh, quoting the Dalai Lama, when, uh, when I heard the Dalai Lama say, no one is special, but everyone is essential. That rattled the very foundations of my being a little bit when I heard him say that the first time. And if anyone's like, but you know, he's a Buddhist and he's going to hell. If a Buddhist is better at being a Christian than me, I'm not even worried about where he might be going. I need to learn from the man. No one is special. Everyone is essential. Because you see, the moment they began to take people into their community and say, you're special and you sit at my feet. And we still do that in all kinds of different ways. How do the poor feel about how the church really treats them? Are we showing them pity? Or are we showing them compassion? And what is the difference? And that evil thoughts, are they really evil thoughts? Well, maybe they are evil thoughts. Most people don't think they have any of that going on, even though they begin to kind of see all of those things. But really, when you walk by someone who's begging, do you have the same reaction to them as someone that you walk by? Who is going to offer you a free cookie and dress in a suit? It's an odd example. Those are evil thoughts that severed the community and the unity of the church. They usurped the place of God. 
and they use the worldly standard that Jesus and now James are fighting against. You see, this is the problem with the world. The world separates people over and over and over and over and over again. And we allow it to let us do that. We participate in the same structure in the We've separated the church over and over and over and over and over and over again. That people who are wondering how we talk about unity wonder if we have lost our minds because we don't show any. So, Barb, I want to offer good news. Because it may not seem like there is much here. Now, he's going to offer repentance, and, and there's a way to learn repentance that isn't about us trying to do it, because he's not saying that you don't believe. He's not saying that. He thinks they believe. He just wants their belief to be true, their belief to live out in the world. And sometimes we need something else to help us make that belief live out in the world. So I'm going to tell one last story, and I'll promise I'll shut up. We made it through four verses. <laughs> When I was a hospital chaplain, and maybe I've shared this story already, I don't even know, there we go. When I was a hospital chaplain, um, one day I got a call to go in for an emergency. I was on call, I go in. And uh, this woman uh, got uh, into the emergency room and uh, she was obese. Um, I, I don't know what her weight was, they didn't know what her weight was. Um, but she was in there. She had not bathed in five years and had not actually left the bed that she was in for those five years. And, and so the, the smell was the first thing that I experienced. I had never smelled anything like that in my life. And uh, before she came in, however, her husband had come home from work and opened the door to their trailer where she had been for those five years. And right as he opened the door to the trailer, he had a massive heart attack and he fell over and died. And it took her an hour to get from where she was to fall over to things, to reach the phone to call 911 to have the paramedics come for her husband who just passed away. Now, to add more insult to injury, when the door was open, her dog ran out of the door and was hit by a car and died. And then she had to suffer the indignity of having the fire department destroy her trailer to be able to get her out of the trailer. And then she's brought into an ER where all of the staff, and the staff in the ER are great, but nevertheless, suddenly you're presented with this whole kind of thing. Uh, and, 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 and she was needing some kind of help. She's in there. And, and, and so they didn't know what to do with her or say to her, and they were a little bit nervous. So they called the chaplain. And why do they call the chaplain in that moment? Well, hopefully the chaplain will say something decent, something lovely, something beautiful. Maybe the chaplain, being the person who's called to sit with those kind of people, the people who others may not, the people that Jesus would sit with, maybe the chaplain will help her. And I remember I got into her room and, 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 and I, I said some nice things. I don't remember what they were, but all I could remember thinking was I want to get out of this room right now. And I was off in the corner trying to get closer to the door so I could breathe outside the door. I don't know. I, I think it was maybe just 10 minutes I was in there with her before this moment happened. I can remember hearing the little footsteps and turning and this little blonde girl, maybe six or seven years old, runs in, doesn't even notice me, runs right by me, jumps onto this enormous woman and hugs her around her neck that had dirt in places and says to her, don't worry, Grandma. I'm here now, and I love you. I've done a lot of things in my life to be ashamed of. But the most amount of shame I experienced was in that split second where I learned what it means to be a minister.
a six or seven year old blonde girl taught me what love is like. And love, as we get into it, isn't the emotional response I feel toward another. It's my sense of loyalty and duty and doing the right action for another human being and for God, because that is God's commandment. And you know what? You do that action enough time, you're going to have an emotional response to that person as well. It's really hard to hate your enemies when you're loving them. It's really hard for them to stay your enemies when you're loving them. So the good news in the midst of all of this is God didn't give up on me, won't give up on you, doesn't give up on this, and James doesn't give up either. Maybe we don't live the exact way that we're supposed to, but this idea that suddenly now we're done is the reason that James is writing this. Is, well, it's not the reason that James is writing it. He's writing it to get people to the place where he can say, you can love like that blonde little girl. And I think I say blonde over and over again because it was just bright blonde and just like a tiny little angel who ran right past me. We can be like that. That's what Jesus has in us. That's what God wants from it. We don't have to figure out how we're separating the rich and the poor. We don't have to do any of these things. We can be the people that let others know in this world that tears them apart and tells them they're not worthy. Don't worry now. I'm here. You're not alone. And I love you. I said that once to someone who was crying when I walked into the room a couple of months later. Still a hospital chaplain. I walk in, I hear tears. I knew I had to go. And I went right up and I grabbed the person's hand and I said, my name is Garrett, I'm the chaplain. I didn't tell her not to worry. That wasn't my job. I said, I'm here now. And I love you. She said, well, you don't even know me. And I try not to be religious in the hospital when talking to strangers. And I said, I know that the universe made you and made you in the image of love. And so I can't help but love you. Have I lived that well? The answer is absolutely not. But I know that it's the truth. So yeah, sometimes we don't succeed at it. Sometimes the poor person comes in and we're not there, but the moment we catch that we're there, I'm sorry. Brother, sister, I love you. And that's the exact opposite of evil thoughts. All right, I've gone five minutes over. I apologize. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not going to apologize for things like that anymore. You can leave at seven o'clock if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> Which is as near to seven as possible. Uh, let's pray. Almighty merciful God, for this moment whereby we might God, we really thank you for all the people who've loved us, whose examples of love have shown us what is possible. And for the joy of your endless calling that we be the same. Grant us the strength to first and foremost accept your forgiveness and thereby forgive ourselves and allow our repentance to be complete when we acknowledge that everybody is a brother or a sister, and when we begin to treat them as such, they'll know how essential they are in your kingdom. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Bless you all. Garrett? Yes? Ted and I met Tony Campolo in Hawaii at one of the conferences he spoke at.